Hello and welcome. I am coming to you as a mysterious disembodied voice in the ether. And today we are having a look at an A2 maths paper. Um, this is the first time I've done one of these on this channel, so be kind to me, you know, don't judge too hard. I'm sure we'll be fine. So the first question is a modulus question, right? It's equations with modulus signs in. Um, by and large, there are two ways of dealing with these. So the key, diff the key point about a modulus sign is the fact that it means that the stuff within it could be positive or negative of whatever the value of the modulus sign is. So if your mod x is 5, it could be plus 5 or minus 5, for example. There are two ways of getting around the kind of uncertainties with this. One of them is to square everything, right? Because if we take 2x minus 1 and square the whole thing, well, now it doesn't matter whether our x minus 1 was plus or minus. That, that, that means nothing to us anymore, right? Because squaring essentially has the same effect as a modulus sign, aside from the obvious change in magnitude. Um, but it, it does the same thing, i.e. it means that whatever's inside your squaring, the sign doesn't matter. So it's essentially doing the same thing, but in a bit of a more natural way. And so one thing that you can do with an equation like this is to just square both sides. Uh, squared. There we go. And then you can solve that, and that will give you your answers. Uh, the alternative is to recognize that if you take a look at this equation, um, your x minus 1 could be plus x minus 1, or it could be minus x minus 1 because it's within a modulus sign, right? And equally, your x on the other side could be plus x, or it could be minus x. Ultimately, however, if you take all of the possible combinations, i.e. this one can be plus or minus, this one can be plus or minus, eventually, your only two situations that are different are either you have the same sign on each side, i.e. plus plus or minus minus, or you have a different sign on either side, plus, minus, minus, plus, right? And by multiplying through by minus one or similar ways, you can turn one any one that looks different into one of those setups. And so what you can actually say ultimately is that well, either the right and left hand sides are have the same sign or have different signs. So you can have two x minus 1 equals plus or minus 3x. This side has a plus on the front, right? It's just a regular number. This side, well, either it's got the plus, the same sign, or the minus, the different sign. This is a quadratic equation. You can solve this to get two answers. This is actually two equations, right? It's one equation with the plus sign and another equation with the minus sign. Each of those will give you an answer. And so you get two answers for x. The second part is probably a lot simpler in a lot of ways, right? The first important thing to recognize is that it's the same equation, right? Except now you have 5x equals your answers, 5 to the x even. And so what you can then say is, well, okay, I have some answers and I have 5 to the power of x equals answer, whichever your answers were from above. The only other important, and, and then you can do that, you know, using logs and all the rest of it. I think you have your calculator for this paper, so that's nice and easy. Only other important point to note is that there is no way to do 5 to the power of a number and get a negative answer, right? Because 5 to the power of a number is essentially multiplying 5 by itself. And there is no number of 5s that you can multiply 5 by to get a minus number, because they're all positive numbers. So if your answer is negative, there is no value for x coming out. So it's 5 to the x equals any positive answers you have. And I think in this case, that's one of your two answers is positive, but there we go. All right, let's move on. So find the exact value of our integral. So this is an integration by parts question, right? We have two parts. We have our x and we have our e to the minus 2x. 
lovely. So we can do with that. Um, there are various ways that you can look at this. You have your integration by parts formula, which I'm not going to write out now because that's a waste of your time and mine, really. Um, some people find this easier to remember using the formula. Some people find this easier to remember using a method. Um, I've met some students in the school who were using a, a kind of a methodological approach. They were just doing things um, without particularly remembering the formula. That is fine. Um, this is a method. That's all this is, right? So if you see a different way to the way you're doing it, if you are getting these all, if you're doing integration by parts, fine, then just stick with that and don't worry about it too much. Um, the important thing about integration by parts to remember is that whatever you have, whatever the two things that you're multiplying within your first integral are, one of them you're going to start differentiating and one of them you're going to start integrating. And your aim, essentially, is to turn it into something where there's only one term left. In this case, right, we could differentiate and integrate either way around. But if we differentiate x, that's going to turn into a 1. So we're going to get rid of it, right? So that's the one that we want to be differentiating. So we're going to want to be integrating the other side. Um, your, your standard kind of formula is that you have u dv by dx dx equals u v minus integral of v du by dx dx. And all this is saying is that, well, your u has gone to du by dx, you've differentiated that one. Your dv by dx has gone to v, you've integrated that one up, right? When you put limits in, the only difference is, well, for these ones, you obviously just put your limits in. For this one, it turns into like what you're used to seeing when you do a, a regular one. So in this case, you would get a half and zero like this. So then you put your x equals a half in minus x equals zero version. OK, I think that's uh, reasonable enough, so we will move on from there. All right, by expressing the equation cosec theta equals 3 sine theta plus cot theta in terms of cos theta only, solve the equation. All right, so um, this is all trig identities. So the first thing that I would recommend doing in these kinds of situations is just putting your, um, turning your cosecs and cots and indeed tans just into your sine thetas and cos thetas, right? So what we have is one over sine theta equals three sine theta plus cos theta over sine theta. This being from cot is 1 over tan, so tan flipped over, and tan is sine over cos, so cot is cos over sine. Right? Now, well, there seems to be a, a nice, reasonably obvious way to simplify this, which is to get rid of all the fractions. And we can do that just by multiplying through by sine theta. So we get 1 equals 3 sine squared theta plus cos theta. And well, now we've got a nice way. We said we wanted cos thetas. Well, sine squared theta we can turn into some cos thetas, right? It's 1 minus cos squared theta. So what you will end up with is an equation with some cos squared thetas, some cos thetas, and some numbers. And at that point, you just have a quadratic equation, right? So what you will have is uh, 3 cos squared theta minus cos theta uh, minus 2 equals 0, I think. It seems reasonable. Um, if, I, if I'm wrong, then the numbers are just slightly wrong. But that's the idea, right? Um, but I should be reasonably right. Uh, and this is just a quadratic equation, except rather than usually you'd have x squared and x, 
now we've got cos theta squared and cos theta. But you solve it just the same way. And you get two answers for uh, cos theta equals something and cos theta equals something else. And then you can just do your inverse cos on the calculator, looking for a, an answer between 0 and 180 in this case, like you're used to doing. And there you've got your answer. So at this point, you're just solving a quadratic equation and then putting it in, into your calculator. So that seems OK. All right, let's move on. So we have a differential equation. Very nice. Uh, and it is given that y equals 2 when x equals 1. So we have a differential equation and we have a fixing condition. Solve the differential equation. Well, the first thing that we want to do is get things in the right place. So this is a differential equation. I'm just sort of randomly drawing on the paper now. Um, this is a differential equation where we can solve it by separation of variables. And essentially, the easiest way to think of this is that we want to get everything to do with x on one side and everything to do with y on the other. Right? So in this case, and, and, and for these questions, you, the easiest way to think about it is to treat dy by dx as almost like a fraction. Um, except when you multiply it up, rather than being just dx and dy on their own, they are integrals. So, if we take everything onto certain sides first of all, we can say, well, I have dy by dx. And if we divide the y down, we have 1 over y equals uh, 1 minus 2x squared over x. And then turning the, splitting these into integrals, we have the integral of 1 over y dy equals the integral of 1 over x minus 2x dx. These are integrals that you are more than capable of doing, and you will get a plus constant. It's worth noting that you actually get two plus constants, right? You get a plus plus c over here and a plus d, for argument's sake, over here. But since they're just both any number that you like, well, any number plus any other number is still just any number. And so that's why you only put a constant on one side. You get an equation involving y and x, you put an and a plus c, you put y equals 2 when x equals 1 in, that fixes your c, and there you have your answer. That seems fairly reasonable. All right, let's move on. By sketching a suitable pair of graphs, show that the equation 5 e to the minus x equals square root of x has one root. Interesting. OK, uh, let's have a look at the mark scheme and see what they want you to do for this. Because is this question 5 or question 6? Hang on, did we? Hmm, yes, I thought so. Yeah, we've lost question 5. Well, there's not a lot I can do about that. OK, well, I don't have question 5, so um, yeah, hang on. OK, I'm going to have a look at the mark scheme. What does question 5 say? Use a product rule. OK, so I think question 5 you're doing some kind of Different. Oh, right, yes, so you're, you're differentiating to find, I think you're finding the turning point of a trig function of some description by the look of the mark scheme. Um, shouldn't be too horrible. You differentiate, and then you just have an equation. The equation's a bit nasty, but it's just a trig equation, so you work through it. Fair enough. Okay, so. Moving back to question six, um, now that we have established that, yes, question five did indeed go missing um, on holiday somewhere, I suspect, having a very nice time. Sketch a suitable pair of graphs. Um, 
it doesn't say what graphs it wants you to sketch. Um, you could quite reasonably, I would argue, sketch a graph of e to the minus x and a graph of the square root of x. That would be not unreasonable, I would have thought. Um, or indeed, 5e to the minus x. Um, it looks essentially the same. So e to the minus... Oh, I've lost my pen. There we go. It's back. So e to the minus x looks... like this. Usually it would pass through 1 here. It's essentially just backwards uh, e to the x because you've just got minus x instead of x. Uh, usually, as we know, e to the x passes through 1. This is 5 e to the minus x, so we've just timesed everything by 5, so it passes through 5. Um, root x essentially just looks like Okay, how do I? Yeah, um, root. So depending on who you ask, <laughs> root x can look like two things. But essentially, it just looks like an x squared graph, but turned around so that it's actually y squared, right? Because when you have y equals root x, well, actually, that's just x equals y squared. And so it's a it's an x squared graph, but in y x equals y squared rather than y equals x squared. Uh, so it's turned around. Um, the argument then that they want you to make to say that this only has one root, well, each of these is a single line in this uh, area, and otherwise they aren't ever in the same area. This starts at zero and goes off to infinity. This starts at 5 and goes down to 0, so they have to cross at some point. Right? They're going to do this sort of thing, and they're going to cross by here. Okay. Um, show that if a sequence of values given by our iterative formula converges, then it converges to the root of the equation in part 1. Um, Okay, so I think this is probably a part that you're quite used to doing. Um, what they're essentially looking for you to do is say, well, if you are converging, then the root of the equation that you are finding is in fact just when these are both x. So you have x equals a half log of 25 over x. You can rearrange this, right? You have 2x equals the log of 25 over x. Am I doing the right thing here? Yeah, I'm making sense. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm confusing myself here. You've got this equation. Opposite of log is e to the power of, right? And then you're going to get e to the power of 2x equals 25 over x. And then what you're looking to say converges to the root of the equation in part i. What you're looking to do is turn it into this format. Right? Flip, flip them over. Do 1 over each of the sides to get the x back on top. You get e to the minus 2x equals x over 25, and then take a square root, right? This is the same as e to the minus x squared, because when you put a power to a power, you multiply. So then you can take a square root, bring the 5 that remains up, and you've got the same equation that you started with. OK, had to use a bit more space there. Use this iterative formula with initial value to calculate the root to two decimal places. Uh, so this is just, you know, put one value in, put the thing into your calculator, get the next, and so on and so forth. Um, that is a procedure that you do. There is not a lot of explaining to be done there, so I think we will move on from that. Um, yeah, the only thing to point out, 
root correct to two decimal places means when your third decimal place stops changing. Uh, so essentially when you know that your two decimal places are the right two decimal places now. Um, so you, you keep calculating values until your, your third decimal place stays the same, and then you know that the two before it are stable. Okay, question seven. We have an equation of a curve. It's a very complicated looking equation. Show that dy by dx equals a thing. So this, this is implicit differentiation, I think. Seems reasonable. Um, oh, hang on. Okay, so they have... Oh, no, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, never mind, ignore me. Uh, right, so yes, this is implicit differentiation. Um, you want to go through and differentiate these terms. And the only thing to, the, the key thing to remember is your uh, chain rule, i.e. when you differentiate something with a y in, you differentiate it normally as though it was an x, but then you multiply it by dy by dx, right? So if we go through and differentiate, we get 3x squared minus 6xy, this is the product rule here, minus 3x squared dy by dx plus 3y squared dy by dx. And then at this point equals 0. Because when you differentiate 3, that's just a number that goes to 0. At this point, you've just got an equation. You rearrange it to look for dy by dx, and you will get your thing. Uh, you can also factorize through by 3, because you know that makes it look the same way that it does over here. Um, so you get x squared minus xy, 2xy, over uh, x squared minus y squared, when you take this over to the other side. So yeah, find the coordinates of the point on the curve where the tangent is parallel to the x-axis. So here is a phrase. We want to talk about, well, what does that mean in numbers, right? The tangent is parallel to the x-axis. The x-axis is flat. It has a gradient of zero. So we are looking for dy by dx equals zero. Well, there we go. Now we can look for, well, how do we make this equal zero, right? You can solve that. You can look for if the top equals zero and make sure that the bottom doesn't explode, um, which I think shouldn't be too much of an issue. But yeah. Um, Yeah. All right. State the point. I don't know. Um, yeah. All, all you want is the top to be equal to zero, right? You want this to be equal to zero. So x squared minus 2xy equals zero. Oh, I see. Right. So there is a nuance to this after all. There we go. So the key points that you want to make are, well, this is going to be 0 if x equals 0, right? So we can say x equals 0. That's one point. And then we have x equals 2y is the other one, right? If you cancel out through the x's, you get x minus 2y equals 0, so x equals 2y. You have two points here which are defined by a certain thing. So you need to find the actual values of the points. This is uh, the second part to this question, essentially, is, well, okay, I have 
equations for these points. So somewhere on the y-axis, there's a, a zero gradient and at somewhere where x equals 2y. You need to find the values by using the original equation. So if you put x equals 0 in, you will get y cubed equals 3. So the cube root of 3, 0 comma cube root of 3 is 1. For the other one, if you put in, if you substitute in either 2y for x or uh, a half x for y into this equation, 2y for x is probably easier, um, you will get an equation in one of these variables, which you can then solve and then get an answer numerically like the other one. Okay, I think that's far enough to talk about. Oh, there we go. Okay, so f of x is our certain function. Partial fractions. So what we want to say is what are we doing with a partial fraction that looks like this, right? So we're going to have a over x plus 1 plus b over x minus 3 plus c over x minus 3 squared. That's the format that we are looking for. We can turn each of these back into this form. So we, when we look at multiplying all of these together, we get a times uh, x plus 1, uh, sorry, a times x minus 3 squared, b times x plus 1, x minus 3, c times x plus 1 equals our, other, our original numerator. And then you can find a, b, and c by trying out different values of x usually is the best way. Try out x equals 3, try out x equals minus 1, and so on and so forth. Um, hence, obtain the exp so, and once you know what a, b, and c are, there you have your partial fractions, and then you have f equals this. Hence, obtain the expansion of f of x in ex ascending, ah, words, ascending powers of x up to and including the term in x squared. So, at this point, we now have actual just binomial expansions, essentially, right? You have x plus 1 to the minus 1, x minus 3 to the minus 1, and x minus 3 to the minus 2. You can do your binomial Taylor series expansions, whatever you want to call them. They are the same thing. Um, you can do your expansions, and you only need to go up to whenever you get x squareds in them. And remember to multiply each of them by the, num by the number on top. So a, b, c. Okay, seems reasonable. Let's move on, I guess. Cool. Okay. Question 9. With respect to the origin O, the points A, B, C, and D have position vectors given as follows. Find the equation of the plane containing A, B, and C, giving your answer in the form AX plus BY plus CZ equals D. So, we have a set of coordinates, essentially, right? Ultimately, when we talk about position vectors, they are they are a lot like that they are coordinates. Um, let me just check what method are they looking for from you. <laughs> okay. So, um, in the mark scheme, they've given not one, not two, but four different uh, options on how you would like to do this. Uh, there are many that you can do. Um, right, so, what do we want to do here? Um, 
I don't want to go through all four of the methods. Uh, at least one or two of them, I think, are actually designed in case people know a lot more about vectors than they are expected to for A-level maths. Uh, Let us see. Let us see. How do we want to do this? Okay. I would argue that the simplest way to do this is almost to actually ignore the fact that they are vector equations altogether and to take this equation that you have been given. Okay? What you are looking for ultimately is the values a, b, c, and d. And you have a whole set of values of x, y, and z that work in this equation. So what you can do is put in 1, 3, it's a, b, and c, right? So 1, 3, and 2, 2, 1, and minus 1, 2, 4, and 1 into these equations and substitute them. Treat them as uh, simultaneous equations, substitute one into the other, eliminate variables, etc., to ultimately find out what a, b, c, and d are. Um, that is probably... The simplest way to go. Um, the, uh, the the one thing to note is that you will you will eventually probably get a ratio out um, because there is a degree of freedom in here. Insofar as if you multiply a, b, c, and d by any by any number, this equation is the same, right? So if you double a, b, c, and d, the equation still works. Uh, so ultimately you will get a ratio, but you can choose to fix any of the numbers and find the others from there. Um, so you will get things like, you know, a equals 2c. I don't think it does, but for instance, uh, a equals 2c. a could be uh, 4 and c could be 2, a could be 6 and c could be 3, etc. Um, that's the kind of idea you're looking at there. So yeah, substituting in and just doing simultaneous equations is definitely the simplest way of doing this and, and the best. Uh, you can do it other ways using uh, knowledge of, of what a plane means in vector terms, but that's, I think, unnecessary in this case. Okay, I've talk talked or been moderately silent and reading a mark scheme on that for far too long now. So let's move on. The line through D parallel to OA meets the plane with equation x plus 2y minus 7 equals minus z equals 7 at the point P. Find the position vector of P and show that the length of DP is a certain length. So I will talk about it first because it, it, and then I won't mention it again. This last part, show that the length of dp is blah. Um, that is very simple to do at the end, right? Once you know p, well, you have x, y, and you have you have the position vector of p, you have the position vector of d. Uh, the length of dp, well, dp is just 
d minus uh, is just p minus d or d minus p, and then you're doing the uh, the modulus of the vector, right? The square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, Pythagoras theorem, etc. Um, so yeah, that's just square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared when you do o d minus o p or whatever you want to call it. So that that part is is quite simple relative to the rest of it. The line through D parallel to OA meets the plane with equation this. Ultimately, what you are looking for here is the equation of a line, right? You have the you have a point through which it passes OD, and you have a direction OA, right? If you've got a direction and a point, you can uh, you can form the equation of a line. And then you can substitute that equation, right? That equation relates x, y, and z. So you can substitute that to get equations to allow you to find x, y, and z. Um, yeah. So the the oh, the probably the trickiest part of this to to think about maybe. And so what I'll talk about here is turning a vector equation into something that you can use in this format, right? Um, your vector equation, if you've got a point and a parallel vector, you've got, well, it goes through D. So we have, and I'm going to draw them as column vectors because I like that, minus 3, 1, 2. That's your D plus lambda. And then your direction vector is OA, which is 1, 3, 2. Okay? We have X, Y, and Z. And so what you can then do is substitute, well, what you've actually got here is X in terms of lambda, Y in terms of lambda, and Z in terms of lambda. And so you can substitute X equals minus 3 plus lambda y equals 1 plus 3 lambda, z equals 2 plus 2 lambda, into this equation. And then all you've got left is, an, is a linear equation for lambda. And I'm sure at this point you are more than comfortable solving a linear equation for lambda. And as soon as you know lambda, well, you can just put it back in here and get x, y, and z. And that is the position vector of p. OK, there we go. I think, oh, okay, so this is the last question, but it's got lots of parts to it, as ever. Showing all your working and without the use of a calculator, that's mean. Find the square roots of the complex number 7 minus 6 root 2i. Okay, so, uh, give your answers in the form x plus iy, where x and y are real and exact. So, how are they happy with you doing this? Yes, okay. So the simple way to do this is to say, well, what do we mean when we say a square root, right? When we say we have the square root of seven minus six root two i equals x plus i y, actually what we're saying is seven, that's not a seven, 7 minus 6 root 2 equals x plus i y squared. Right. You square this, you get x squared minus y squared plus 2i y. Okay. Now we can equate real and imaginary parts. And so what we get is x squared minus y squared equals 7, and 2y i, you can, you can ignore the i's really, 2y i equals minus 6 root 2 i. So yeah, you can just ignore the i's always. This just gives you y straight away. y is minus 6 over root 2 in this case. And then once you know y, this is just an equation for x. So you find x and y, and there you go.
Um, X, you will find, has uh, two values here. <coughs> mm. So, yes. Gosh. Okay, there we go. Uh, right. Let's continue on then. Um, don't think there's much more to say there without actually just putting in a calculator. I say putting in a calculator. They have asked you to not use a calculator, so... Oh, yes, I'm being completely foolish, aren't I? This is 2iyx, so this gives you 2yx equals this. Um, the way you want to do this, then, sorry, a little bit... Uh, <laughs> there we go, my apologies. This you can turn into an equation for y in terms of x or x in terms of y, either way works, right? So you can get y equals some number of x. You can then substitute that into this equation, get some values of x, put them back into here to get the equivalent values of y, and that's how you're dealing with that. All right, so for instance, you can say y equals, uh, well, minus. 6 over root 2 x and then this becomes x squared minus si uh, 36 over 2 x squared equals 7 etc etc um, yeah that seems ever so slightly wrong but there we go Okay. Uh, right. Let's let's move on from there. Okay. On an argand diagram, sketch the loci of points representing complex numbers w and z, such that we have these things. So, first things to note: we have two very generic types of things here. Whenever you have a modulus equals a number. That's a circle, right? And then it's a circle about whatever point you're subtracting from your w, right? So w minus 1 minus 2i. So th this is w minus 1 plus 2i, right? Which is just the distance between w and... Th this is the distance from... 1 plus 2i. And it's a circle it's a circle of radius 1. Right? So this is saying, okay, I find 1 plus 2i and I draw a circle of radius 1 around it. The other one, this is saying argument of z minus 1 is 3 uh, 3 fourths of pi. Right? 3 pi over 4. 3 pi over 4 is this direction, right? This is pi, uh, this is pi over 2, this is pi, this is 3 pi over 4. z minus 1 means, if, if the argument of z minus 1 is this, then our actual z has to be plus 1 over. And so it's going to be a line like that, except it's moved 1 over, 1 to the right. Because this is the line argument of z equals 3 pi over 4. This is the line argument of z minus 1. Because if we take 1 off any of these points, we just move 1 to the right onto our other line. Okay. Last part. Calculate the least value of w minus z for points on these loci. So... The way I've drawn it, uh, they actually overlap, but I'm guessing that that's not actually true. Um,
No, it's definitely not true. So, uh, yeah. So our actual line, it's going to start at 1. And so this, this is 2, this is 1, this is 1, right? So this has a radius of 1, it comes down to 1. This is going backwards at 45 degrees, so it goes through 1. OK? Calculate the least uh, distance. You can do this by recognizing that where the point lies. Alternatively, you can turn these into an equation in real and imaginary, right? So if we call real x an imaginary y, then you can say, well, I can say what this equation is in x to, in terms of x and y, and I can say what this equation is in terms of x and y, and find a distance. Um, or there's probably a simpler method that you've Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you can you can do that. Um, however, the simplest way to recognize it is to say, okay, I want a perpendicular line, right? The closest point is going to be where, wherever our our closest point from the circle to our line is. That's going to be wherever we are furthest away from the edge, right? Our circle is pointing out away from the edge. Uh, edge, center, literally the opposite of one another, but there we go. The circle is away, we're moving away from the center. The further away from the center we can get in the circle, the closer we are to the line. Um, we have a perpendicular line, and this distance here is our, um, this distance here is what we're looking for, right? W minus Z. We can find the length of this line by dealing with a perpendicular line here. We want a perpendicular to, for the line from here, from the center, which is one plus two I to our line. And then we're subtracting one because this, this length here is just one. We know that from our circle of radius one. So whatever length we find here, length the nearest length from our center to the line, we subtract one from that, that's the nearest length from the edge of the circle to the line. I think I've done a terrible job of explaining that, but we are going to leave that there. Um, yeah, okay, so hopefully this was reasonably helpful to you. Um, leave any feedback in the comments or wherever you are seeing this, if you so desire. Um, yeah, and I will see you next time, next math paper, I guess. All right, bye-bye, good luck.